Aloha, I'm Lila Berg, and we're here at the Waikiki Aquarium, ready to meet the people who inform, inspire, and impact our daily lives. Thank you for joining us on Island Focus. Near and dear to your heart. This is um, one example of our conservation programs at the aquarium. This is what we call our coral farm. And what we do here is we grow, propagate corals and then distribute them to universities, researchers, and public aquariums throughout the world. These are actually South Pacific corals. We've got a similar program behind the scene which does only Hawaiian ones. In the past 15 years, we've sent over 7,000 pieces of coral, and they're distributed right throughout the world. There's probably not a single public aquarium on the US mainland that hasn't had some corals from this exhibit you see here. How fabulous. And how did this idea even come to you? This has been in place 30 plus years. The aquarium was, one of the, was the first place to keep corals successfully in captivity. The first one to do this type of propagation and the originator of the methods they now use to send corals around the world. So there's a long and storied history of coral research. Here. We don't usually think of corals as being alive. Yes. And they are not more than alive, they're living and propagating as well. Absolutely, absolutely. The white corals that you see in gift shops is actually the coral skeleton, mm. and over that is a living tissue, which is part animal and part plant. Fabulous. Well. Thank you very much for doing this. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It truly <laughs> is. Mahalo for tuning in to Island Focus and joining me in meeting Dr. Andrew Rossiter, who is the director of the Waikiki Aquarium. What a fabulous place you have for us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming here. Yes, thank you for your time. And just give us a little background on who you are and why this place is so special to you. I'm originally from Wales in the United Kingdom. Um, got my PhD in freshwater ecology. Three days after getting my PhD, I was off to Japan for ostensibly a two year stay, again studying freshwater biology. I ended up staying 20, 20 years with a three year interim in Canada running a project on lake sturgeon conservation. I got a associate professorship, and then 14 years ago, I got this position as director of the Waikiki Aquarium. Well, aren't we blessed that you have longevity in your, in your <laughs> bloodline, you know? <laughs> this place actually has longevity too. It's the second oldest aquarium in the United States. Really? It's 114 years old. And so what, what has given it that lifeline and that specialness, especially to you? For me, um, when I came here actually for the interview, I was really impressed by the quality of the exhibits, but most of all, the potential that this place has. It's in an island state in the middle of the Pacific. What is there, what is there not to have potential about? And the fact that we highlight the fishes and uh, marine life of Hawaii and the South Pacific is another big, big plus for me. And thirdly, we're part of the University of Hawaii and um, going forward, well, even now, we're uh, starting to focus on research, conservation and education, which I think a public aquarium in these, this day and age has to do. Well, I remember growing up in this area mm -hmm. and also visiting the aquarium. And, you know, I, I'm always surprised when many of our children are not familiar with the ocean environment. Yeah, it's, it's both shocking and sad to me that sometimes we get uh, school groups of, of kids here and we've got a touch pool where they're allowed to handle hermit crabs oh, and cool. other things like that. And some of the kids from Hawaii, it's the first time they've ever done that. Mm. They've never been down to the beach exploring rock pools with friends or parents or relatives, whatever. And you know, in Hawaii, you're never more than 20 miles from the ocean, so that's, that's kind of sad. Well, and growing up in Wales, mm -hmm. it's a very different environment. Yeah. 
cold and wet. But somehow, I think it was your father that triggered that interest in you. Yeah, it was my, it was my grandfather, actually. When I was a, a kid, about five or six, uh, we used to have uh, Sunday lunches at my grandparents' place, which was just across the street. So I should, I should backtrack and say we lived about 150 yards from the sea the cold grey Irish sea. <laughs> but uh, every Sunday we'd have chicken or beef or whatever and my grandfather would always cut a little piece off and put it at the side of his plate. And then when everybody had finished eating, he and I would go with a little piece of meat and toothpicks, walk along the shore <laughs> to, to tide pools and we'd feed the gobies, the fish, the oh. sea anemones and such like. And I can remember that as if it were yesterday. I've come to the aquarium on different uh, events as well, and I think that there are a lot of volunteers that are here too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've got about 300 volunteers. Some of them have been here over 25 years. So I think that speaks to A, their commitment to the place, and B, the, the opportunities that we provide. The aquarium probably couldn't survive without the input of volunteers. They are that integral to what the aquarium does. And secondly, all of us, all us aquarium folks, we're, we're behind the scenes doing all the, the mucky stuff. The volunteers are out here interacting with the public, so they're the face of the aquarium. Well, actually, it's pretty fun to be out here. I think so, yeah. <laughs> what is it not to like about this? They can tune into your uh, website, I'm sure, and, and find I'm, out I'm Absolutely, yeah. Check on the website. There's ample opportunities for volunteers in various capacities. We've been chatting with Dr. Andy Rossiter, who is the director of the Waikiki Aquarium. Mahalo for being with us too. We're here at the Waikiki Aquarium meeting Melissa Iwamoto, who is with Pacific Islands Ocean Observing System. That is quite a mouthful. <laughs> it is. I know there's an acronym that's easier for people to remember. Yes. Well, first, thank you so much for having me, thank Lila. You. Um, yes, so the Pacific Islands Ocean Observing System, it's a mouthful, but for short, we call it PAC IUS. And what we do is we believe that coastal and ocean information helps save lives and protects livelihoods. And that's a big task, it's a big chore. It's a big labor of love for you. It is, completely. So what we really aim to do is make sure that we provide and empower our stakeholders by providing accurate and reliable coastal and ocean information that is easy to access and easy to use. You know, as an island, we are sinking, which islands do, and at the same time, water is rising. How, how do you help people understand that there's a natural flow of the environmental changes. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's uh, ways that we can protect ourselves. Yeah, I think one of the most important things, especially in the short term, which is kind of the timeline that we deal with, is making sure that you're well informed so that you can be safe and you can keep your family safe, um, as well as your property. So one of the things we do is provide wave run up forecasts, mm -hmm. where you can, in the short term, up to six days in advance, know what the sea level is, but then on top of that, what the waves are doing and how that's impacting the shoreline. I'm sure surfers appreciate that. Definitely, <laughs> they do, yes. We also have wave buoys out in the water that surfers love and they, you know, depending on how much you surf, some of them check them daily to know which breaks to go to, um, which part of the islands and things like that. So this location at the Waikiki Aquarium is very special for you as well. One of the things that uh, we have right outside the aquarium that most people wouldn't know about is a water quality sensor, just to monitor the status of the water quality and the characteristics. How is it doing with fresh water, with temperature, which are all really important for the coral reefs. How did you get involved in this topic? That's a great question. Just a love of the ocean, really. And I work with mostly all oceanographers and uh, marine biologists. I myself am a social scientist, so I love just bringing, mm -hmm. making that connection between the scientists and then the public and the community, and as well as the agencies that need the information. Do you do uh, group tours to specific places, or do you work with children in schools? When the Waikiki Aquarium, for example, has the Malcolm Makai event, we come, we have a booth, and we do educational opportunities for the kids. So I mentioned water quality before. We'll have, for example, 
uh, little buckets with different uh, levels of soil in them to show water clarity and how important that is and what that means and how you measure it. So we do things like that, which are really fun. What would you want people to do with the information? One of the things they can do that's very easy is go to our website, packiuse.org, and just know what the conditions are going to be, what they are now, and also forecasting out a couple days. What's a memory you have of something that was really successful or that gave you a sense that what you're doing is important? I think one of the things that comes to mind almost immediately is there was um, a stand-up paddle boarder, I think it was a year or two ago, that lost his paddle right off uh, in Waikiki, right off shore here. And he, um, so he went adrift. He couldn't get back in the shore. The waves were bigger than he knew. And he started just floating up towards uh, the west, on the west coast, towards Waianae. And with our short-term ocean current models, the U.S. Coast Guard was able to, to predict where he would be, wow. and they, they rescued him. So that really hit home that what we're doing is really important and really truly does save lives. Yes, well thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us, inform us, and also for the important work that you do. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. We've been chatting here at the Waikiki Aquarium with Melissa Iwamoto from the Pacific Islands Ocean Observing System. Thank you for being with us. I'm here at the Waikiki Aquarium with Randy Kosaki, who is with NOAA. Please explain what NOAA is and then how special our location is for you. Well, NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So we're kind of the counterpart to NASA. You know, they do space and, and space flight, and we do the seas and the skies. And so I work with a part of NOAA called the National Marine Sanctuary Program. And we protect special places in the ocean and Great Lakes as uh, national marine sanctuaries and marine national monuments. And being at the Waikiki Aqu Aquarium is very special for you. Well, as a marine biologist, you know, <laughs> this is some place I almost grew up coming as a kid. And my first job right out of college was here at the Waikiki Aquarium. So yeah, this place is very special to me and it was very influential in terms of driving me into this career. So now speaking about your career, you are in charge of a very large area. Well, the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument is 580,000 square miles. Um, so it's bigger than, I think, 49 of the 50 states. Only Alaska is bigger. We're twice the size of Texas. So it's an enormous area of ocean, coral reefs, deep sea, blue water. We've got all kinds of marine habitats. And most of it's very poorly explored. And so how, how did this come about, that it's a monument? Well, we're part of the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So we were on track to become a national marine sanctuary. We had run a lot of public meetings and had over 50,000 individual public comments, mostly all of them in very strong support of a high level of protection for these reefs because they are so special. And President Bush decided, we've had enough of a public process, we've heard from the public, let's just get this done. And so with a stroke of a pen, with a presidential proclamation, he created the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. This particular area is it's more than special. Well, it's, it's special, it's unique for a number of reasons. Um, biology is one of them. We have so many species there that are not found anywhere else in the world. And it's relatively pristine because it's, it, because it's so remote, very few people have ever gone there. There's no commercial fishing there. And so it represents what a completely pristine Hawaiian reef ought to look like. And I'm sure what they used to look like a thousand years ago or what they could look like with better management. But it's also a culturally very significant place because it was accessed by the Native Hawaiians many hundreds of years ago. There are some very, very significant heiau and shrines, uh, probably navigational landmarks. Uh, the island of Mokumanamana sits directly on the Tropic of Cancer. And so at the summer solstice on June 21, the sun is directly overhead. And that fact was not lost on the ancient Hawaiians. And so they used it probably for many uh, ritual purposes, religious purposes, navigational purposes. A lot of those ancient uses have been lost, but there's no question that it was an incredibly special place to the ancient Hawaiians and to the modern Hawaiians. Did you know all this growing up here in Hawaii? I'm kind of a fish nerd, so <laughs> I was very well aware of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and how special they were, but we still find that's one of our biggest challenges is just the geography lesson. 
do you get there? Well, we use NOAA research ships. Uh, there is an airport at Midway because it was a military base for many, many years. So you can fly to Midway. But the other 10 major islands have no infrastructure, no buildings, no roads, no airports, no electricity, no flush toilets. And so we use NOAA research ships and we can go basically where we want, use the ship as sort of a floating hotel, get hot showers and hot food every night <laughs> and go diving all day, every day. Wow, it sounds like a dream so, job. Yeah, it's a great way to see some of the most <laughs> remote and untouched islands in the world. I mean, this is one of the last really great natural areas left on Earth. One of the last really wild areas, like the National Wildlife Refuge or the African Serengeti. And we have one of those really special places, and it's right here in our own backyard, and most people don't even realize it's there. So, so if you had a parting comment to our audience, what would that be? The Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and Papahanaumokuakea show us what our ecosystems here used to look like. You know, those islands are in pretty good shape. We don't do much except monitor them. But what we learned there has its best and highest applications here, where we could use that to improve the health of our ecosystems here in the inhabited islands. We've been chatting with Randy Kosaki with NOAA and talking about the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Thank you for being with us. So I remember this exhibit this location as a child. Mm -hmm. It was just stunning when you mm -hmm. look at the variety of life here. Absolutely. Huge, huge diversity. And uh, like you, I remember this. When <laughs> I came here for my interview for this position, this was the exhibit that really knocked my socks off. It's probably the best representation of the diversity found on a, a natural barrier reef that I, I've ever seen. How does it work? You know that there's anemones and fish and sand and coral and... Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very delicate balance to get everything right. Luckily, we've got very skilled aquarists here who can take care of all of that. But this, this like you said, highlights all the different groups on, on, that you find on a natural reef. We've got a giant clam here, which is the largest and oldest in captivity anywhere in the world. Oh, my. What, what do you think we feed it on? <laughs> I have no idea. Sunlight. Really? That's all we do. Inside the skin, there are plant cells. Sunlight hits it, they photosynthesize, and they give their energy to the clam. Oh my gosh. So that even in something that looks as inert as that, there's lots of things happening. Where would I find this if not here in Hawaii? Um, you can go to Marshall Islands, Palau, okay. you find yeah. them. Yeah, no, no clams like this in Hawaii. Right, but the fact that they all get along, I know that it's not necessarily true <laughs> that they're like humans. At, at, the, at the moment. At the moment. <laughs> Fabulous. Best behavior for the camera. Today on Island Focus, I have the pleasure of speaking with Carly Weiner, who is with the Schmidt Ocean Institute. I'm glad you're with us too. And thank you for taking the time. Oh, thank you for having me. So maybe you could explain a little bit about what the Schmidt Ocean Institute is. Absolutely. So Schmidt Ocean Institute is a nonprofit we are globally centered and we have a research vessel, Falcor, that sails all around the world doing cutting edge oceanography and marine science using technology and disruptive techniques to really advance the pace of ocean science. Okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> so essentially that means we have a boat that goes around and scientists apply for ship time every year. And what we pick is projects that wouldn't typically get funded. So we're looking for things that are going to advance the pace of science openly share the data that is collected so anybody can use it and really make a huge impact uh, globally, both for conservation and for advancing technology to do the research. So as an example, does the ship come to Hawaii? Yes, actually, we've come to Hawaii quite a lot and uh, we consider Honolulu our unofficial home port. We've done 12 different research projects here in collaboration with the University of Hawaii and we've gone to places like the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, uh, Loihi Seamount off the Big Island. And so we've done all kinds of different research from mapping to exploring hydrothermal vents to looking at the small microbes and bacteria that exist in the ocean. There's so much to learn. Is this your background too? It is. Um, so I started off 
uh, in communications and kind of made my way to marine science, uh, starting first with marine mammals and now working with oceanography. Uh, and it's always exciting because it's a different project every time we have a new scientist on the ship. So I'm constantly learning. So there's different facets. There's so many different facets there about is. the ocean and the environment. Um, if there was a young person who was just even slightly curious about what you're saying, what would you say to them? Well, don't give up and have passion. There are so many different career choices that you can make around the ocean, not just through uh, marine science, but all even just the positions on the, on the vessel that we run, you know, from navigation to engineering to a chef. Um, so there are lots of avenues uh, to explore your passion for the ocean. And it's really, that's the key, right? The passion yeah, for the ocean. Absolutely. So sitting here at the Waikiki Aquarium in the, in the middle of Waikiki, um, it's special for you being raised in Toronto. Yeah, I've come a long way from a landlocked, cold place, um, but being by the ocean is so important to me and to my family and to my career that I do. And it's important that we communicate about the ocean um, through our organization. We have so many different learning opportunities for families and students from um, online lesson plans to weekly video updates of what's going on the ship because we want to share what we're doing with everybody else. And so in terms of learning and teaching, it's for adults as well as young people. Absolutely. K through gray is what we say. K and through gray. Yeah. <laughs> we work with a lot of classrooms here in Hawaii. Uh, we do a lot of online sharing. All of our dives that we do with our underwater robotic vehicles get live streamed on YouTube in perpetuity. So anybody can be an explorer or a scientist and come watch any of the dives that we're doing and see in real time the same things that the scientists are discovering. Yeah, you know, I really appreciate you being here to, uh, I guess, I encourage and give us some enthusiasm to take our environment into our lives and not just be in the environment. It's important. There's still so much we don't know about the ocean, and that's one of the things we're really trying to accomplish is being able to see new underwater sea mounts and map areas that we haven't been to and discover new species. And that's important for conservation. We can't protect what we don't know. So parting word. Well, please continue to learn and be interested. Know about your ocean. It's in your backyard here. Um, and you can learn more about what we're doing at SchmidtOcean.org. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. We've been chatting with Carly Weiner of the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Thank you for being with us today. With us today on Island Focus is Cindy Knappman with the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much for having me. You must really enjoy this interview in, at Oceanside. I could not be more <laughs> thrilled to have it right here. This is such a wonderful opportunity. <laughs> Please share us a little bit about what the Sea Grant College Program is. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program has actually been in existence for 50 years now. We just had our 50th anniversary. Uh, we were instituted in 1968 and we're part of a larger network of programs around the country. They all have the same focus as we do. There are uh, 33 programs around the country at coastal universities mm -hmm. and also at Great Lakes. Um, so all up and down the East Coast, the West Coast, Great Lakes, um, there's even a program in Puerto Rico, hmm. and then um, one in Guam, which is one of our newer programs. And really what we do is we try to be a bridge between university research and the community. So we try to take what's most relevant to the community, what their needs are, and address them by bringing the most um, applicable and cutting edge science to address the issues. So what does that mean in layman's terms? Sure. <laughs> um, well, let me give you an example. For instance, we're working now on um, sea level rise issues, and that's such a critical um, uh, issue to Hawaii right now. Um, so we're taking studies that all of the university researchers, including um, Dr. Chip Fletcher, who you're mm -hmm. probably familiar with, their findings, and we're working with people that um, 
are having coastal erosion issues, are um, needing to figure out, you know, what does the state do in 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now? Um, so we're working on reports that will assist the state, just give them some direction on, on how to address these types of issues. What can people do, you know, besides be informed? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, like you said, I think they can just really be informed on um, what the current issues are and if there's certain steps that they can do to address things like climate change, um, you know, just even personal choices like, um, you know, maybe turning uh, off getting, the water when you brush your teeth. Turning off the water, that's right, you know, um, greenhouse gases and things like that, just anything that they can do in their own home. How do you alleviate the, the worry and the fear, you know, mm -hmm. that tends to surround topics that mm -hmm. are so big mm -hmm. um, and that we don't really know what to do individually. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when topics are so large, like the issues of climate change and sea level rise, that people think that as an individual there's nothing that they can do. Um, but like you just said, you know, there's always certain things that you can do to make a small difference and that small difference is like a water droplet. It adds up in a larger bucket and it really makes a big difference worldwide. So as a program, mm -hmm. you're tucked into another department. Yes, that's right, that's right. So um, as I mentioned, we're part of a network of 33 programs around the country, and we're under the um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration on a federal level, and then we're all based at coastal universities. So here in Hawaii, we're under the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. You know, how can we encourage young people to uh, go into the field as well? Through the research that we fund, um, every two years we fund different university research, we require them to have a graduate student involved in the research mm. that they do. So um, we really think it's incredibly important to fund the next generation of students who will become the leaders in 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and then we also get involved at the high school level too. There's a program that um, the high school students are able to study marine science questions and then come together in a competition where they can, um, kind of like a Jeopardy style competition. So, fun. <laughs> so we address both graduate and undergraduate and high school level. And are you seeing an increase in interest and enthusiasm? We really are. I mean, especially here in Hawaii when we're surrounded by the ocean and every time you go out, side, you know, the kids are surfing and they're engaging in the ocean in different ways. So we really see a lot of um, interest from the students in the ocean sciences. We've been chatting with Cindy Knappman of the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Appreciate you being with us today. Mahalo to the Waikiki Aquarium for hosting us today and to you for tuning in to Island Focus. I'm Lila Berg. Aloha and malama pono. Take care of each other. See you soon.